Hello everybody, welcome to the Bean Bird 2 channel where we talk about testimonies and the goodness of God. And today I'm going to be talking about contrasting cowardice with faith. Of course, God calls us to live lives of faith and cowardice is mentioned in the Bible actually quite a few times. And one of the most notable that people recall is from Revelation 21 verse 8 where there's a solemn warning that's given for those who will not uh, be going to heaven, those who will be outcast and cast into the lake of fire. And I'll read it right now in Revelation verse um, 21, verse 8. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now this isn't an exhaustive list of all sins, but it does name a few for people to consider. And um, there's a cross-reference here also for 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, where it says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed and you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the spirit of our God. Though Christians can be guilty of committing some of these sins, our lives aren't defined by them in an unbroken pattern of acceptance of these sins. We may have um, committed these and then we ask for forgiveness and the blood of Jesus forgive, forgives us, but when it's referencing here, this type of um, sin pattern that leads to hell is an unrepentant lifestyle. And it lists some of the sins that are included um, and in an unrepentant lifestyle. And so it also says that um, some of these people were uh, just falling into the sin and they were just going deeper and deeper into it. They were unrepentant. They weren't washed by the blood of Jesus. And so when we're washed by the blood, we are sanctified and justified eternally by God's grace. And we are set free from, from the bondage of, you know, sin and, and, and the second death. Um, so what we don't want to do is um, take God's grace as an excuse to indulge the flesh saying like oh I'm forgiven therefore I can live however I want because the Lord does call us to live lives of holiness and to seek forgiveness and to walk in relationship with the Lord those things are essential to the Christian walk a life of faith and so contrasting here a life of faith and also cowardice which back to as I first mentioned in Revelation 21 verse 8 being a coward is listed as one of the first sins in that list. Um, is it listed first because it's in any particular order of severity? I don't think so, but it is listed the first thing it happens to be. And so I wanted to do a little study on um, cowardice because I think a lot of people read that and think, hmm, that's, that's not something I would put along with murders and other types of what we would think of as being like more serious sins. So, but cowardice is something that the Lord doesn't want us to live our life in that lifestyle. And so we should know why. Um, and then it can help caution us against like guarding ourselves from this way. Um, so why does God um, not approve of cowardice? Well, it's the opposite of faith and we're called to live lives of faith and faith glorifies God and when we're cowardly that doesn't glorify God and uh, we are commanded by the Lord that we should have faith and we should be bold and we should be confident because when we have faith and we're bold and we're confident it shows that what we really think about the Lord if we believe that he's strong and capable and competent and omniscient and all the things that the scripture says he is then we will live bold lives of faith but if we don't believe those things, then we could find ourselves shirking our duties or hiding or not uh, doing the things that the Lord specifically calls or commands us to do. 
We see that in the story of Jonah. He ran from the Lord's will in his life to go to Nineveh. But then we see other stories of David who wasn't willing to, um, to not fight the Lord's battle. He saw that the Philistines were challenging the Lord's people and, and he was bold and stood up and was like, no, this, you do not um, threaten the Lord like this. We, he was willing to stand. And um, we see that also another example of Jesus calming the storm. He calmed the storm and he was telling the people, don't be of little faith, don't, don't be cowardly, um, because he commands the wind and the waves and the storm. Because at that time, his disciples didn't really fully understand who he was. Um, they were learning about him and they were listening what he was teaching, but because they didn't fully um, understand that he was God at that time, um, and he, they were still kind of veiled from the teachings that he was giving in parables, um, they ended up going into more cowardly behavior because they didn't really understand the fullness of who he was. And so we want to make sure that we're going on a journey where we're growing our faith, we're learning about who the Lord is, and um, that will strengthen our faith and make us more bold. So um, what is cowardice? Um, so I looked up some different words to kind of learn more about it, and some synonyms are apathy, passivity, neglect, indifference, contentment with slavery, unfeeling to the distresses of others, unwilling to work and put forth effort, rejecting liberty and freedom that is offered by the Lord himself. And when we reject liberty and freedom that's offered by the Lord, we are, you know, in a sense, accepting sin because we're choosing sin over freedom. We're choosing bondage over freedom of the, in the Lord. And so when you look at it that way, there is more to um, cowardice behavior than, than what we might think just on the surface level. And so I want to take a look at Judges, uh, the book of Judges, starting with chapter 4. There's a great example there of people of Moraz, and they didn't come to fight in the Lord's battle when they were called to action. And so Leading into that, I want to start with chapter 4 in the very first part when it says, Then the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, the king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera. And the sons of Israel cried to the Lord, for he had 900 iron chariots, and he was oppressed the sons of Israel severely for 20 years. So here we see the Israelites are being oppressed uh, for 20 years and they cry out to the Lord and the Lord hears their cry and he comes to rescue them from the slavery and to set them free. And he goes through Deborah, he uses Deborah um, to free the people. And she goes to Barak and she says to him, um, you know, that she wants him to go and he replies and says, if you go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the honor shall not be yours on the journey that you are about to take. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hands of a woman. And so here we see Barak was intimidated to go forth and Deborah wasn't. And the result was that Deborah ended up getting um, more of the recognition of that battle and what ended up taking place there. Now, Moroz, Mar yeah, Moroz is a town that was along the way and they were called upon to um, get behind the Israelites and to help them in this battle. We hear in the beginning of chapter four here that there were 900 chariots that were against them and they had called to Moroz to assist them in this battle, and they didn't come. Um, and so they cried out for help and support and assistance. And the Jews were under bondage from the Canaanites, and they were wicked. And this battle would have set them free, but it also would have helped the town of Moroz be free as well. 
and yet they were cowardly in not fighting. They were unwilling to work and they didn't want to um, jeopardize their, their life maybe. Um, they were in a sense rejecting the liberty and freedom that the Lord was offering them because he had prophesied through Deborah that he was going to lead them into battle and free them. And so they were apathetic to this cause and so they refused to help the Lord. And we know that in Matthew 25, 40, Jesus said, And as much as you have done, if unto one of the least of these brethren, it's as if you have done it to me. So in this sense, they were being lazy, cowardice, they were being passive. And in the, the ending result of it was in Judges chapter 5, verse 23, there is a curse that is given to the town of Moroz. It says, Curse Moroz, says the angel of the Lord, utterly cursed its inhabitants because they did not come to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the warriors. So because they failed to help, they failed to get behind the Lord and his cause, they were cursed. And this is a big thing. We don't really talk about curses too much in the day to day. But um, to have a curse put upon you by the angel of the Lord um, would be a very big deal. Um, it would definitely affect the people that were alive and then the generations that were to come. Um, and so um, this curse was commanded to come upon them by God himself. And they were cursed bitterly, a double curse. Okay, so... Um, the other important thing to note from this battle is that God summoned the people and some the people that willingly responded, they were blessed. And the people that refused the call were cursed. And the enemy was in great number and power, but the Lord freed them and he is able and he follows through on his word. And this is one of the times where um, the Israelites were willing to face a much stronger enemy because they had the promise of God that he was going to be with them. And God honored their faith in going forth in battle and delivered them. And we um, see that they were successful in battle as we read in the whole chapter 5 of Judges where we have the song of Deborah and Barak. Um, and we can remember that from Romans 8, it reads, For if God can, is for us, who can be against us? And that is true today. The Lord is for you. He's calling you to do something. We want to make sure that we are doing the things that the Lord has set before us and we're not being like Jonah where we're running away because we don't want to do what the Lord has called us to do. And so, um, and also we see in here that the people were facing an enemy that seemed overwhelming, but it was an opportunity for the Lord to show his supreme power over um, the nations and the world. And so the Lord was glorified in that battle being secured and won. And his people were set free. Um, but the people of Moroz, they, um, they didn't obey, they didn't believe, and they just kind of took the, the way out of just uh, passivity and neglect. Um, and so we need to make sure that we're committed to doing God's work and that we're not wandering out of our purpose that the Lord has set before us. And we don't want to count ourselves out. We don't want to sit on the bench, but we want to make sure that we're actively uh, pursuing a relationship with the Lord and that if he speaks something for us to do or go or someone to talk to, that we are being obedient in doing those things. Because when we do those things, the Lord is glorified. Uh, because even if the opposition looks mighty or impossible, even more so, is the victory suite when the Lord is the one who secures the victory in that. And so I looked up a few Bible verses to go over here. And so Proverbs 28 verse 1 reads, The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. And I love that because it's like, wow, we, we are called the righteous, we, the righteous before the Lord because we have the blood of Jesus. And... Um, we can be bold as a lion, and it's the wicked that flee. Second Timothy 1.7, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and of love and self-control. And then Proverbs 29.25, 
The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. And Deuteronomy 31, 6, Be strong and courageous, do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. And then in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, it says, Therefore we are not cowards, nay, even though our outward man is wasting away, yet our inward man is being renewed day by day. Isaiah 40, 29, he gives power to the faint and increases the strength of the weak. In 2 Corinthians 4, 1, Therefore, since God in his mercy has given us this ministry, we do not lose heart. And then Deuteronomy 31, 6, be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. And Joshua 10, 25. And Joshua said to them, Do not fear them, neither be cowardly, but be courageous and strong. For thus the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom ye fight. Joshua 1, 9. Lo, I have commanded thee, be strong and courageous. Be not cowardly nor fearful, for the Lord thy God is with thee in all places, wherever you go. And then um, John 14, 27 in the God's Word translation says, I'm leaving you peace. I am giving you my peace. I don't give you the kind of peace that the world gives, so don't be troubled or cowardly. And um, Matthew... 826. This was Jesus talking to the, the men on the boat. He said to them, why are you so cowardly, you men of little faith? He then got up and he rebuked the winds and the sea and it became perfectly calm. And the men marveled and said, what kind of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Isaiah 35, 4. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. And then 2 Timothy 1, 7, For God has not given us a spirit of cowardice, but of power and of love and of self-control. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul is speaking here and he says, Do you think that I am a coward when I am with you and brave when I am far away? Well, I ask you to listen because Christ himself was humble and gentle. Some people have said we act like the people of this world. So when I arrived, I expect I will have to be firm and forceful in what I am to say to them. Please don't make me treat you that way. We live in this world, but we do not act like its people or fight its battles with the weapons of this world. Instead, we use God's power that can destroy fortresses. And I, I really want to emphasize that last part in verse 3, where it says, We live in this world, but we don't act like its people or fight our battles with the weapons of this world. Instead, we use God's power that can destroy fortresses. And we use that armor of God that we see in Ephesians 6, the helmet of salvation, and um, you know the sword of the Spirit, and all the other armor. And we, we, we pray, um, and prayer is essential. It does um, move things and change things, and the Lord has chosen to operate through our prayers because he partners with us in that way. And I think when we really understand that the Lord is in control of everything, the beginning, the end, and nothing happens that he doesn't allow, we really realize that prayer is a way of offering intercession and inviting the Lord to move and act in these situations. And really, it's the Lord that moves and uh, has less to do about us and what we do. Um, of course, there are, since we are physically in this world, there are actions that we do for the Lord, but we begin to trust and realize that he aligns our steps and that nothing happens that he doesn't approve of and that he is in complete control. And so I want to go back to the very beginning where we started, which was Revelations chapter 21. The very first part of that, before it talks about the list of sins, it says in verse 6, And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give you the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. And that's something that is so beautiful. We really 
can't um, take that for granted that the Lord is offering us to be sons and daughters of God and he we can trust trust and rest in that he is the beginning and the end and there's a promise in this verse I will give the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts and he offers that to you freely today and every day and so we should take advantage of that if you haven't accepted Jesus as your savior, do it now while you still have breath in your lungs. Every day is an opportunity to serve the Lord and to love him and learn more about him. And there's a promise there that we will overcome and we will inherit uh, all things. And then the Lord himself is saying, I will be his God and he shall be my son. And of course, or daughter, if you're a female like me. Um, so that's amazing that the Lord Jesus came down to us to make a way for us to be reconciled with the Lord. And we should be, you know, when we really believe that and take that in, it does uh, make us live lives of faith. And we know that we have a great hope in a future, that we have heaven and Jesus set before us. And um, we can live with greater confidence when we have our trust in the Lord. So I hope that that's helpful and maybe learned something today through all that. And um, it helps me to, um, you know, this is a, a study for myself as well. You know, the reason why I was even studying this was um, just wanted to learn more about um, that list of sins there. And I feel like it has helped me feel more confident in living a life of faith and being bold. Um, learning how to trust in God that he's really handling it and sometimes I get this false sense of I'm doing things or I'm controlling things and that just leads to stress. Um, we, the more that I feel like I'm in control or I'm the one making decisions, the more I feel stressed about it because I'm always afraid of overthinking like did I say the right thing, did I say the wrong thing, did I do the wrong thing, did I make the right choice? And those types of questions can easily spin into anxiety and fear, which the Lord hasn't called us to walk in or live in. And so uh, we are commanded to live lives of faith. And um, that's something that I'm seeking more and more every day to learn and understand. And so I hope that this helps as well. And I think that's about it for today. So um, have a good day and I'll see you all later.